product, so we're all set. So, basically today, we're going to be talking a bit about the economic or political economy, really from 1935 through to 2000. And as I said before, how labour change, particularly from 1972 or 75, from this, from 1981 to this, essentially which are really Keynesian social democratic manifestos to what you're getting today, which is basically a sort of warmed over version of national, which in itself is a warmed over version of act. So we're going to be looking at basically how the social democratic state really fell, and essentially how social democratic economics basically became neoliberal economics. Um, so essentially that's what we're going to be actually discussing this on today. And so it's really going to be a bit of a follow-on and so on from someone else's country, uh, which you saw on Wednesday, which is an excellent film, and I'd encourage everyone to actually get a copy of it. And essentially also to basically read Bruce Jessen's uh, books and so on, one or two starting with Fragments of Labour, which was basically a breakdown of the New Zealand Labour Party in the 1980s. It goes into some depth about what actually happened there, uh, through to essentially, of course, um, their purpose is mad, which is the last book which was published, I think, in the mid 1990s. Again, Jason, very readable, and essentially, if you want to have a, a good analysis and a good breakdown of New Zealand political economy, he's definitely the man to read. So, essentially, it would be true to say, I think, that the state played a major role in the development of New Zealand's political structure, and it's, that's basically its economic infrastructure. Primarily, the state was involved because it was one, it was a lack of private capital in the new colony, as we discussed previously, and of course because of the fact that the state was really the only institution that was large enough to actually do anything about that. So it was the only institution that was really there that could actually establish wide, wide scales of economic development and so on. And so, and the last one I think I mentioned, for example, it was impossible to run a train, for example, from Christchurch to Invercargill, the fact that they couldn't actually agree on who was to pay for it, the infrastructure and so on like that. So it was actually up to the state to actually step in and start nationalising the railways so they could actually start running trains. So there were things like that, telegraphs, telephones, all these things were actually done by the state. You couldn't leave it in the hands of, in fact, um, private, private investment. The other thing I forgot to mention too was the fact, you know, that in the aftermath of the Christchurch earthquakes, um, the state, of course, became once again through uh, involved in insurance. Again, the state used to actually have a role in insurance, mainly because, again, there was a problem inside of getting private insurance to actually sort of uh, basically insure people in the case of natural disasters in New Zealand. Hence, the state established government life, which Roger Douglas, of course, instantly privatised in the 1980s on the basis that why should the state own an insurance firm? But of course, that had already been proved in the 1890s as to why the state should own an insurance firm, and it proved yet again in 2011 why the state should be involved in insurance. So, you know, this is, so I apologise for a start, this is going to be a bit of a rant because. I really hate these people, and essentially I'm going to be quite upfront about it. I joined the Labour Party in 1982 as a fresh-faced 14-year-old. At that time, the leader of the Labour Party was a man called Bill Rowling, and essentially Bill Rowling was, for all extents and purposes, an honest guy who was essentially a social democrat who believed and basically things like free education, free health care, progressive taxes, regional development, all those things that the Labour Party believed in. And yet over the purpose, of, you know, over the course and so on of the next what, seven, eight years, as Dennis and I were discussing before, the Labour Party moved from that into something completely unrecognisable. And as a result, you know, the, the soul and the conscience of the Labour Party, the party that I joined, completely changed. And these people need to be held responsible for what is really their rubbish economics 
and the extension of their rubbish political economy is actually responsible for it and for what a lot of what is actually going on and continues to actually go on today. So I'm sorry if this is going to be a bit of a rant at times, but you know, essentially I think I need to be upfront and so on about that. So, like I said, it's true to say that the state was actually involved and so on for the 1890s. With the election of the Liberals in 1890, there was more emphasis, I think, placed on delivering fair economic outcomes and benefits for the wide masses of people. And so a number of economic reforms were put in place, including the first introduction of an income tax to high state expenditure, and a number of agencies, government agencies, were created, uh, particularly around industrial relations and so on like that, so the arbitration courts, the arbitration system, the Department of Labor was created, a sort of miniature Department of Housing, and the state also invested in actual state housing through the Working Men's what was it, Dwellings Act or something like that in 1905. But it was not financed properly with the result that very few houses were built and in fact people couldn't really afford to live in them. So it's a lot like Kiwi built. But you know, essentially they did try. Um, and of course, as I said too, the use of the leasehold was favoured by the Liberals as a means of breaking up the larger states in favour of small farms, although it was very desirable, as to what real effect they had. But certainly the station holders and so on were broken up, small farmers became established, and of course a lot of land was passed into crown ownership and so on during this time. Now, in the 1930s, there was a move primarily as a consequence of the Great Depression and also as a means of New Zealand becoming more self-sufficient to impose a wider range of economic controls and regulations. And essentially what we've got here, as I've said, is New Zealand's political economy prior to 1935. This person up here is a man who went by the name of William Downey Stewart. Stuart was an endowed neoclassicalist. He believed in classical economics. And what he did was essentially state departments and agencies were run like businesses. The state was primarily there to foster private enterprise and private businesses. Tight fiscal and monetary policies were imposed to ensure balanced budgets. Okay. So if all this sounds familiar to you, because it is. Essentially, this is much the same that the government actually, the same formula that the government actually follows now. Downey Stewart was a great advocate in sign of these things. He believed in responsible government. A responsible government meant a government that actually ran along business lines. Ironically, Downey Stewart was also good friends with Harry Holland who was the first leader of the Labour Party, and there's people that are Marxists. Despite the fact that they came from opposing political views, Downey Stewart and Holland actually respected each other, even though they disagreed with each other. And there was actually a sort of um, discussion, a book discussion. Holland, of course, was a great leader, a reader, as was Downey Stewart. And what would happen is that Downey Stewart would buy two books, and he'd give one book to Harry Holland, and then they'd go away and they'd read the books. And then about every couple of weeks they'd come together and have these huge debates in Parliament and so on over the books. And people would actually come to listen to Holland and Downey Stewart debating the books. And then they'd go away and repeat the entire thing. The result of it was that you've got a very stimulating economic debate, and Harry Holland got to keep the books. So, you know, his book collection grew astronomically as a result. But Stewart was definitely a classicalist. But as the Great Depression continued on, it became very apparent that this formula, classical economics as endorsed by Marshall and various others, was not working at anything. It was prolonging the Great Depression by sucking out domestic demand and actually not allowing the economy to actually recover. It was also quite apparent that private enterprise was not stepping into that gap, it was not preventing it, and in fact, if anything, private enterprise was doing what it usually does, which was to actually shut up shop and retrench. The result was 
that, of course, as we discussed last time, was the United Government had gone into coalition with reform, led by Gordon Coates. Coates became very enamored of Keynes. Coates actually read Keynes. And Coates also surrounded himself with a group of young men, of which William Such, Paul Such, and you may have heard Such's name prop up in a, a number of, um, sort of articles on New Zealand history, and called the Brains Trust. And these young men were very, very enamored with Coates with the reading of Keynes and around the economists of that and around Keynes. As a result, what they did was they started advocating, for example, for the fact that there might not need to be balanced budgets. They could actually fund the deficit. That the state should intervene during these times. And one of the first things that the state should be doing is ensuring employment and ensuring a reasonable standard of living through higher wages to actually ensure that you had good domestic demand. And the state could do that, of course, by actually owning the Reserve Bank or creating a central bank to do that, and by actually ensuring that there were good overseas reserves and, of course, you know, things like tariffs and so on like that. This was, of course, a complete anathema to poor old William Downey Stewart who promptly called his former boss and Deputy Prime Minister a communist, said that he refused to serve as finance minister or minister of finance under him, um, and basically Coates said, well, fine, okay. And then he said, stand aside and I'll become minister of finance, which is what happened. So, Coates then started to actually implement an embryo a lot of what Labour actually put in place in 1935. Okay. Now, let's be quite blunt about the Labour Party. So, I think it's fair to say that New Zealand from the 1930s and 1980s, as I said, largely, oh, sorry, uh, now, it was the first Labour government that became associated with active state-led economic planning and development and was accredited for the establishment of the wealth of the state. Um, Labour introduced certainly a number of social security benefits and increased or widened the scope of those already in existence. As I said, Coates had already started implementing these sorts of things. For example, he created the Reserve Bank as a means of actually enabling the government to actually borrow money and have more control over its currency and over its um, fiscal budgets. Um, he made things such as pensions, were made universals, unemployment and sickness benefits, child benefits, and so on like this. And to consolidate, coordinate these reforms, the government, the incoming Labour government, created the Department of Social Welfare. The Labour government also imposed a number of labour reforms, compulsory unionism, and introduced a 40-hour week, which had basically was not only a reform to ensure that people got weekends and so on like that, but actually had the effect of reducing unemployment and so on as well. And in the economic area, it improved upon the economic reforms that codes had created and introduced a number of its own. These included the nationalisation of the Reserve Bank because even though Coates had created it, it was essentially a privately owned bank. The extension of state advances for housing loans and the creation of the Department of Housing and the extension of economic planning and regulations and the initiation of import controls and licensing. And all of these policies were designed with the arm of fostering New Zealand industry and to maintain New Zealand's economic stability, full employment, and a high standard of living. Now, despite conservative assertions that Labour was, in fact, radical and communist, and this cartoon here is actually from 1925, and this is the Labour Party jalopy, essentially, and here, of course, you had Bolshevik 1 and Bolshevik 2, fighting over the uh, control of the jalopy, getting, of course, the Labour Party economic jalopy and so on into complete chaos. 
This was not actually the case at all. Labor had, for the past 10 years prior to this, really sort of uh, basically sought to play down socialism and something like that. It was not really in any sort of sense militant. And there was a huge debate, for example, that broke out in the Labour Party in 1944, when, in fact, um, of all people, Walter Nash wrote to the uh, Russians and basically on his commiseration on Lenin's death and was immediately criticised by James Bakun, who's the MP for Littleton, who said that, in fact, Labour wanted nothing to do with Lenin and the murderous Bolsheviks. So there was a huge, huge debate within the Labour Party. So economically and politically, Labour had already moved away from that sort of uh, it was never really there. And they come to adopt what they became known as the mighty cat law. It was actually a title of a book, and essentially McCombs, who was really the Labour Party economic spokesperson, along with Michael Joseph Savage, adopted, said that Labour needed to adopt this. So they were very early readers of Keynes, and they were very early readers of, of the economists and so on around Keynes. People think that Savage, for example, was, and this is something that John A. Lee sort of talks about in his various books, that Savage was somehow or other an economic imbecile, that like Longy, he didn't understand economics and so on like that, but that is not true. Savage actually had a very, very good understanding of economics. And in fact, he had been taught economics at the WEA, where he won prizes for actually being still economics. So he was no economic slouch. And when you read what McCombs and Savage could talk about in Parliament, you realise how switched on they both were. They could quote chapter and verse from Capital. They could quote chapter and verse from Lenin. They could quote chapter and verse from the Bible, and they could quote chapter and verse from whatever economic book they were reading at the time. So very, very switched on individuals. So Labour was really only revolutionary in the manner in which it really challenged existing economic orthodoxy. Uh, during its 14 years of government, Capitalism remained in place, now reformed, regulated, and restrained. And the new focus was really prompted, uh, basically, um, one of its principal opponents, Martin Nista, who basically who was a private secretary to Sid Holland, who was a National Party's first leader, to say in 1944 that after nine years of socialist government, private enterprise is still paramount nor does there appear to be any likelihood that within the near future at any rate, state enterprise operate more than a fraction of our industrial life. So, yes, the first Labour government, as I said, really set the, um, the scene for New Zealand's social and economic growth and development all the way up to the 1980s. Established the wealthy state, established the system of Keynesian economic management, and of course there were high levels of state intervention and so on within the economy to actually ensure that things ticked along. So, even though National, of course, actually came into power in 1949. Um, and basically, apart from two very brief periods between that and 1984, uh, when it was out of power in 1957 to 1960, with Labour, second Labour government in 1972 through to 1975, third Labour government, National actually didn't do much to actually really sort of upset the apple cart in terms of Keynes and Rights. When it did come into power in 1951, Sid Holland did have a rush of blood to his head. He did actually start to deregulate and basically remove import controls and there was an immediate imbalance of exchange crisis, an unemployment crisis that scared him so much because he was also, of course, in the time of the massive feud with the waterfront strike with the unions, 
that he immediately reimposed all these controls and so on then. He could only impose one battle on one front at one time. So essentially Labour and National really didn't do much about it, much like the Conservatives after 1951 and so on in the UK didn't really do much and so on about the welfare state implemented by Atlee's government. So, so basically, really it was sort of the high point of song of uh, basically hazing economics throughout the 1960s. Um, so, as I said, the center of Keynesianism was actually reached, as we touched on at the last lecture, with the election of a Holyoke government in 1960. And although associated with the liberal and more market wing of the National Party, Sir Keith Holyoke proved to be an accomplished mediator. I quite like this. The Secret Life of Walter Committee. You've all read this. This is how Sir Keith Holyoke actually did practice government and so on during this time. So there you have him, Walter Committee, and Sir Keith Holyoke. And of course, he had the operating theatre up there, of course, Jack Marshall, Holyoke. I think that's Harry Lake of Maldoon and New Zealand. And it was Committee, Committee. And that's essentially what happened. Everything that was seen during the 1960s was run by committees. If there was a problem, Holyoke would immediately institute a committee into actually looking at the problem, or a board of inquiry, or something like that. And you know, this would involve, involve, you know, not only the employers, but the unions, and the idea was to actually reach a consensus. And this is what Holyoke did throughout the 1960s, and was actually partly responsible for his longevity as a Prime Minister. So, it's really, National's economic direction can really be summed up with the phrase that Holyoke often uttered, which was steady as she goes, uh, essentially breathe through your nose and not make any waves. He was aided in this approach by his Minister of Finance, Harry Lake, and the Minister of Labour, Thomas Tom Shan, who was actually a grizzled old cocky who became quite pally with the uh, Federation of Labour and essentially he basically um, had what in Holyoke's own words, Malvin's words actually, he didn't like Shan, an unholy alliance or an unholy relationship with the Federation of Labour and so on as well. And and a means of implementing wage deals and so on like that. So essentially that was how the government sort of functioned and so on during that time. Now, in his book about Holyoke, uh, Keith Keith, again, good read, by um, Barry Gustafson. Gustafson writes, the way in which the Holyoke government functioned could be attributed to the nature of the man himself. Holyoke was a compassionate conservative long before that term was coined. He was prepared to spend very large amounts on social security, although he did have some concerns about its bureaucratisation and the waste of taxpayers' money. But he accepted largely, without qualification, the need for the state to provide a reasonable level of economic and social security for those in need through age, sickness, or unemployment. Ironically, essentially, for example, Holyoke's government was one that said in case ACC. He was also, in his government, it's also one that started actually implementing sickness benefits and extending out solo purpose benefits and so on like that. So Holyoke thought that these were necessary things to actually do to ensure not only stability but the economic security and so on of New Zealanders. So there was a consensus across political lines too, largely because of the fact that the Labour Party also accepted both parties accepted the Keynesian consensus and they both accepted the idea the state needed to be actively involved economically and actively involved socially to ensure that the 
homemade and well being. So, there were a few hiccups. In 1972, uh, the United Kingdom joined the European community for the common market as the D9, uh, which effectively ended uh, New Zealand's basically reliance, guaranteed access to the United Kingdom, which had been the basis of guaranteed market for farmers. This meant that New Zealand had to search elsewhere for, for trade and so on like that. Uh, but during this period, uh, New Zealand did it. It actually improved its trade with other areas, China, the Soviet Union, the United States, and of course, basically, it also started implementing free trade deals, first of all, with Australia, known as CER, Closer Economic Relations, and so on as well. So, even though there was a bit of a hiccup in the, in the joining of the EC, it actually didn't penalise New Zealand that badly and so on as well. I mean, New Zealand's balance of trade and its trading relationships actually increased. It's always something that the neoliberals used to say in the 1980s, which is like, oh, you know, of course Keynesianism was doomed, Quentin, because of the fact that we had guaranteed markets and so on like that, and as a result, you know, we went trading, blah, blah, blah. The fact is we were, and our trading relations have actually improved. So that was first of all. And New Zealand continued to weather really the outside economic storms very well. The economy was strong, it was stable, wages were high, unemployment was virtually non-existent. And in fact, at various times during the 1950s, 60s, and early 70s, the level of unemployment stood at zero. And in fact, um, again, there was no sort of um, government sort of crisis about how bad it was that unemployment was so low. This was seen as a good thing. And there was a crisis in the year of my birth, 1967 though, when unemployment reached the staggering high amount of 10,000 people unemployed. And there were marches throughout the country to stop the staggering amount of unemployment. And the government listened and actually then went off and created these jobs or basically in within the economy and by the time of the year's end there was zero unemployment again. That was how governments used to deal with unemployment during that period of time. Um, now, and really, as I said, basically unemployment was virtually non-existent. Government policy was to maintain the state of affairs and it did so so during its economic management, the use of economic tools, as I said, such as centralised wage bargaining, high social spending, import and export controls, and government investment in various projects, especially infrastructure. Governments, whether they are Labour or National, tend to believe not only in economic infrastructure building at a national level, but they also believe in this wonderful thing called regional development. And that is the fact that the governments felt that they actually had, you know, needed to actually ensure the undeveloped regions of New Zealand required or needed economic building and so on like that. And the government had a role to actually play in that economic development. And in fact, in these manifestos, Labour makes that commitment very clear that only national infrastructure can only be built if you have strong regional development and so on. And that included things like railway lines, shipping, all these things needed to actually be developed and so on like that, and the state had an active role to play in them. And one of the key central roles of government was the need to plan and forecast. And it did this through various state agencies such as Treasury, uh, which incidentally was a very, very watered down version monolith that it is now, and it also did it through departments such as the Ministry of Works and agencies such as the New Zealand Planning Council. The New Zealand Planning Council was a creation, I think, of the Holyoke government, but also of the Kirk and Maldoon administrations that brought together unions, employers, government agencies to actually look at and plan economic direction for the country. And as a result, what infrastructure and so on should be developed and so on. So it was an ongoing planning apparatus. 
the government also received alternative advice, as I said, from the Ministry of Works through what the Ministry of Works Planning Department. And what the Planning Department would do is essentially go away and look at these infrastructure investments and then give an analysis and so on of them. Interestingly, in 1984, when the Douglas and the Longy Douglas government came in and Treasury implemented a wonderful document called Economic Management, they essentially said that we needed to privatise everything and that, in fact, um, you know, the market was the, best, was the best arbitrator and so on of economic thought and direction. The Ministry of Works Planning Department wrote a very, very thorough analysis of this, basically saying it was crap. And that, in fact, if they did this, what would happen is that there would be high levels of unemployment, high interest rates, high inflation, and in fact New Zealand's indebtedness would actually increase, and instead of solving the problem, it would actually make it worse. They actually also referred to Thatch as Britain, because, you know, at the time. When it came to the first round of deregulation and uh, privatisation, the first department up against the wall was the Ministry of Works Planning Department. <laughs> Especially recommended by Treasury. So all these arguments about how much they encouraged and loved competition did not extend, extend to their own competition. So, you know, they were gone. Just again, wanted to make a bit of a rant and assurance there. Yeah? So, what actually happened at the end of the Golden War? And you may recognise these two gentlemen here from last Wednesday's Documentary, David Longy and Roger Douglas. We'll talk a bit and so on about them and why, in fact, Roger Douglas became Minister of Finance. Now, in the early 1970s, the world economy was starting to run into a number of problems. These were caused by several factors. There was the overheating and the imbalance of the US economy which were a result of the uh, two things. One was the Great Society, which uh, basically Lyndon Bain Johnson was very committed to. Johnson had come up, of course, dirt poor. He was very envious of basically the wealthy states and the Keynesian systems that existed in Europe. He wanted to do some, something similar to the United States. He wanted to actually introduce a uh, sort of, uh, universal welfare system, jobs, and so on like that. The problem that he had was that he also wanted to get rid of those goddamn communists in South Vietnam. And so it came down to a basically a fight as to whether or not he should fund the Great Society or whether or not he should fund the Vietnam War. And of course the Vietnam War won. So the economy started to overheat. Um, and as a result, there was also the, um, as well as a sudden increase in the price of petrol, and this was a result of uh, OPEC. Uh, basically, up to this point, <coughs> petrol and petroleum products have been very cheap. And then in the early 1970s, the uh, oil producing nations have got together and essentially formed OPEC as a means of basically bartering with the developed nations. As a result, they basically drove up the price of petrol and limited demand. So there was an oil crisis. So you probably all remember that in a certain age as well. And New Zealand, like a number of Western economies at the time, saw both <coughs> inflation and unemployment increase. Governments sought to maintain, contain these increases by increased regulation and spending to maintain wages and employment. Now, in 1975, in New Zealand, Labour fell victim to the economic crisis that swept the world at this point and was moved from office by a national government led by the former National Party Prime Minister, Finance Minister Robert Muldoon. Um, ironically, one of the principal reasons for Muldoon's victory in um, 1975 was the removal of the rolling government's New Zealand super scheme which was a contributory scheme in favour of a compulsory state-funded retirement scheme called the National Super. Okay. And one of the reasons about this was Maldon played in a lot of fear, essentially saying that, of course, the state 
super scheme or the Kiwi super scheme of the national of the Labor government, uh, which was also state guaranteed, uh, essentially would allow the government to nationalise large chunks of New Zealand. And for those of you who probably are to get but Dennis will probably remember them of the dancing Bolsheviks. Where essentially Maldonian had actually got these people in to actually uh, uh, produce a number of ads. And one of them was essentially that the national or the New Zealand super scheme of the Labour government would allow the country to actually be bought up by the government. And we all know what that means, don't we? And then these dancing Bolsheviks came across the stage. And it worked. Because people were actually sucked into that. Plus, of course, you know, essentially there was great fear, unemployment was rising, and there was a fear that Labour had lost control of the economy. Interestingly, the minister behind the New Zealand or the Labour Party's New Zealand super scheme was a young minister called Roger Douglas. So he was actually responsible for that, and he was a minister of broadcasting as well, who basically set up TV2 competition with uh, TV One. So that was when he made his first appearance, Martin. Okay. So, however, despite Maldon's lack of personification as a lover of state invention and spending, his third budget in 1976 contained a commitment to economic liberalisation and scrapping of controls and licences. He also lowered some benefits, increased prices, and so on like that. But again, much like Sid Holland's government in 1951, he ran into economic issues almost certainly right away and now doing reimpose them. Um, and then from then on, uh, for the most part, now doing pursued a largely Keynesian approach, which although conservative, maintained wages and government spending. So that was the situation all the way up, really, in 1984. Now, in 1984, these two gentlemen here were elected as the fourth Labour government. And it was increasingly fell under the direction of Finance Minister Roger Douglas. Douglas went in the opposite direction and implemented a range of economic reforms designed to free up the economy and supposedly make it more competitive. Similar policies were being introduced by Ronald Reagan and by Margaret Thatcher. Uh, the implementation of neoliberalism by Roger Douglas was not about economics as such. It was really about the capture of a political party by an ideology. Rogernomics, as became known to its association with Roger Douglas, was formulated in the bowels of Treasury and the halls of academia. And in the late 1970s, the New Zealand Treasury and Reserve Bank had been taken over by a number of people who subscribed to the belief that the solution to New Zealand's economic problems could be solved through the implementation of market led policies and a reduction and elimination of public ownership or control. Maldoon was quite aware of this. He was quite aware of what was happening in Treasury, with the result that he started to ignore Treasury's economic advice. Maldoon then started to call on other economic analysts, particularly upon the Minister of Works Planning Department, to actually go about and sort of implement his sort of ideas. This led to a very much what one could say is sort of a, a hostility between Maldoon and two of his chief government. Treasury, as a result, started to reach out and so the Reserve Bank and place people into government offices and into the offices of the opposition. So one of them uh, basically found his way to become one of the key buddies and spokespeople of Roger Douglas during this period of time. Douglas very rapidly fell under Treasury's spell. Now, in the late... Uh, as I said, in 1972 to 75, Douglas had served the Minister of Housing and Broadcasting, um, and he had grown increasingly disenchanted with the direction of the Labour Party since 1975. 
uh, Labour under the leadership of, of Bill Rowling, maintained a belief in Keynesianism as a means to resolve the country's economic issues. The Labour Party state its commitment to economic renewal on the basis of planning and development through the coordinating of state departments, um, local government and regional development. And in 1981, the Labour Party manifesto, Labour and Rowling clearly spout this out by saying our way of life cannot be sustained without a strong and vital economy, without full employment and the ability to control our own destinies. Okay. Douglas became very, very opposed to it. And he wrote what was going as an alternative budget in 1979-1980, which he then released. Ironically, the alternative budget is far to the left of the time of what we're doing at the meeting now. But Bill Rowling was so incensed with this challenge and so on to Labour's economic policies and programs that he promptly stripped Douglas of his portfolio and sent him back to the back benches. As a result, Douglas actually at that time, this was in the early 1980s, considered retirement from Parliament. So he went and spoke with his friend, David Longy, and Longy said to Douglas, don't be worried, Bill's days are numbered, I will be leader, you will become Minister of Finance, stay with me. And so as a result, Roger Douglas stayed. Otherwise, we could got rid of him in 1981. That's simply the story. So, Treasury, as I said, was seeking to expand its economic and political reach, placed advisors into the Labour Party's economic unit. Douglas rapidly fell under their sway, and he and others in the party became increasingly convinced that economic salvation lay in the development of the free market and reduced government involvement. They also were busy reading a two with the, they were quite enamoured at this point with what was happening in the UK, particularly with Margaret Thatcher. And they corresponded to Mrs. Thatcher and her ministers and so on as well, you know, as to really what was happening and so on. And I've got a wonderful letter from Phil Goff where he actually praises, praises Mrs. Thatcher and her low inflation and uh, basically employment policies and so on there and so on. I can actually show it to you. So remarkably. Um, and so with the removal of Rowling as Labour's leader in 1982 and the ascension of David Longy as Labour Party leader, Douglas was virtually giving a free hand to write Labour's economic policy and shape the program of the incoming government. As I said, giving again substantial help by Treasury, who presented the new government with two substantive economic programs which have been predicated on neoliberalism. The first of these was a document called Economic Management, which called for the restructuring of the economy and the creation of a free market and greater freedom for the private sector. The second briefing was called Government Management and was released in 1987. Um, and it was basically built on the foundations of economic management and it was an openly political document advocate for the corporatisation and later privatisation of key state assets. Now, along with the advocacy of individualism, the Labour government individualised unemployment, whereas unemployment had been seen as an actual outcome of the capitalist system, and that was all the way up to 1984, regardless of whether or not you were Conservative or you were Labour, Capitalism was seen as part of the system, it was cyclical, and so as a result, the government had to actually act to actually resolve it. Under Douglas, particularly, and from that moment on, capitalism became, or unemployment became, something moral. In the words of my old mentor, Jim Flynn, uh, to Pete Holson in 1990, it was like in 1984, a comet flew across New Zealand, and it sprinkled laziness dust everywhere. So all these people who actually held jobs and, and wages thought, we don't want to work any longer. We want to become part of the great unemployed and promptly left their jobs and joined the unemployment benefit. 
obviously this is rubbish, Chen would say. You know, this is a deliberate outcome of your policies. But the government would actually say that even though it was, it became something moral. You were unemployed because of the fact that you were lazy. And the unemployed became stignified as a result and so on of this. So basically, and this is also the government stuff referring to something called NARU, the natural rate of unemployment. And the natural rate of unemployment was 4%. Whereas previously, the natural rate of unemployment had been nothing. It was okay now to actually have an unemployment rate of anywhere between 4 to 6% because it also did something else. By actually having a natural rate of unemployment, by having a reserve army, you could drive down wages. You could keep unemployment, you could keep inflation low, and as a result, you could keep economic and fiscal policy and so on tight. So actually, by keeping high unemployment, it actually suited the market and it suited the government. Now, as you can imagine, People had no choice to become unemployed according to the Treasury. And the free market Treasury theorised that people would simply move from one job to another as determined by the marketplace. And this belief, particularly as it grew throughout the 1980s, led to the, uh, a lot of criticism of the Treasury and the government being arrogant and out of touch and basically economically, economically lunatic and theoretically not being driven as rooted in reality. It, the advent of economics also caused substantial ruptures in society and within the Labour Party and the Labour movement. Um, and you probably touched on some of those on being on Wednesday. The government saw massive protests for farmers, workers, etc., criticising its callousness and its economic deafness, high unemployment, combined with high inflation and living costs led to unions campaigning against the Labour government and its new ministers being targets at party conferences. Now, by the end of 1987, David Longy had also become very critical of the Douglas' programme, with the nada of the relationship being reached in the months following Labour's second victory in that year. Now, at this point, Labour had become, well, Longy had become convinced that neoliberalism would not deliver the fairness and cohesiveness that he had promised in 1984. Because in 1984, as again, Dennis will remember, it was basically we had to get rid of Maldon, the country was unfair, it was controlled by large foreign corporations, and essentially, you know, there was a lot of unemployment. By 1987, the economy was definitely unfair. We were definitely controlled by large corporations, and there was a large amount of unemployment. But Longy had actually gone to the country in 1987 and said, look, we've had a lot of pain, but the economic pain is now over. This time, we're going to actually be looking at redistribution of, our social, of the social wealth that we've created during the first term. So the second term will be basically on education, welfare, employment, and jobs. However, no one had told Roger Douglas this. And in, 19, in late 1987, on the, um, after Labour had won a second election, uh, essentially Douglas basically uh, he suggested a range of economic, uh, further economic reforms including industrial reform, so all those people and so on who talk about, oh well, the Employment Contracts Act, you know, National was responsible for it. Labour had already laid the roots for that in 1987. And the introduction of flat taxes. Douglas had also suggested that the tax rate needed to be flat. Now, basically, over the Christmas and New Year period of 1987-88, Longy had finally decided that maybe the figures that Roger was quoting didn't actually really pan out. And he'd started taking other economic advice. He basically told Longy that the figures really didn't pan out. 
And in fact, instead of actually, you know, um, creating works, instead of actually maintaining that social investment that he so wanted, or they actually have the opposite effect. So, Longy came back, he called a press conference, where Douglas was still on holiday, and he said, I've thought about this, it's all cancelled. It's all off, and basically we're going to have a cup of tea and a lie down, and then we'll think about what we're going to do next. The result of that was essentially open civil war in the cabinet, uh, which resulted in basically Douglas resigning from his position, then being reappointed by the Labour caucus back in the cabinet, and then Longy basically resigning from his position as Prime Minister and appointing Jeffrey Palmer. And eventually Palmer, of course, being rolled by Mike Moore on the basis that Labour wouldn't win the 1990 election. And then, of course, Labour lost quite dramatically the 1990 election. So, which, of course, led to the election of this woman. And that is Ruth Richardson. Now, National was not immune to the chaos caused by neoliberalism. In the late 1980s, basically, uh, or the mid-1980s really, Mal Doon had remained leader of the National Party. He had been very, very critical of Douglas and of basically what was happening with Labour. No, none more so than basically in the aftermath of 1984 with the so-called constitutional crisis. And I think that this will be covered too in someone else's country on Wednesday. But basically what had happened there was essentially Labour had become elected. The Reserve Bank had said for the incoming government they needed to immediately devalue the economy. Uh, otherwise, New Zealand would be bankrupt and broke. And Maldoon, as the outgoing Prime Minister, refused to do this, which led to a constitutional crisis because the incoming government had said they would do it. The result was that Maldoon was eventually forced to actually be valued, and as a result, uh, basically, the, the, the groundwork was then set in their liberalism. However, what is not mentioned, but did come out in the 1990s, was in fact that Roger Douglas had been going around the business houses in Wellington and Auckland and saying, look, when I'm Minister of Finance, we will immediately devalue the dollar. We will devalue it. With the result that major finance houses and businesses had actually taken the New Zealand dollar and removed their finances out. When they conducted to devalue the dollar, they had brought their money back in and cleaned up. Maldoon knew this, and as a result, he consistently told Lonnie what was actually going on. Longy refused to acknowledge it. And as a result, when the dollar was devalued, these people immediately brought their money back and made millions. Maldoon knew there was nowhere where they could take their money. And from that moment on, essentially, the game was set for neoliberalism. Maldoon became very critical of the approach and so on of the government criticised the opening up the markets and of course the fact that uh, as a result of the government's uh, what was it, retrenchment and privatisation programs, inflation roared up, I think at one point it was about 18% or something like that. Inflation rates or interest rates I think hit the mid-20s and the result was essentially Lolly and Maldon became very, very enamored said that you know the price freeze, wage freeze had to have remained on or be gradually lifted and was promptly ignored and so on as well. So for a brief period, National was actually to the left of Labour. This ended in 1985 uh, with the election of Jim McClay, who promptly rolled Maldoon. Uh, Maldoon then basically sought his revenge 
and essentially promptly talked to Jim Bolger, who then enrolled with Jim in the play. So, by 1990, what had happened, of course, was that essentially national become committed to neoliberalism, and the incoming national government was a committed advocate of the economic and philosophical platform of Roger Douglas through Ruth Richardson, uh, who, in fact, Bolger had appointed as the national spokesperson. Ruth Richardson had essentially also in much the same way that uh, Douglas had gone and spoken to finance leaders um, and uh, basically saying, well, look, it doesn't really matter what our manifesto says, this is what I say. National's manifesto it had not actually suggested what Richardson was going to do, but she had made the same sort of speech to those finance ministers to saying, well, look, our manifesto says X, but you can take it from me that when I'm Minister of Finance, we're going to slash and burn, we're going to essentially deregulate the labour market, we're going to cut uh, basic benefits, and we're going to cut government spending and continual privatisation. So she had already made that commitment and so on to the finance ministers prior to the, to the financiers, prior to the election. So in 1991, Richardson presented her first budget, what was called the mother of all budgets. Uh, it was a budget which, as I said, slashed Social Security and launched a new round of privatisation and cost cutting and completed the recommendations that Douglas had attempted to implement and failed. Uh, basically, the mother of all budgets, as became known in the later Employment Contracts Act, was essentially the high point of neoliberalism in New Zealand and in both national labour. Uh, both of these events had and continue to have significant economic and social impacts on New Zealand in terms of wages, benefits, and so on. In the case of the 1991 budget, the effects of it were immediate. Their result, I think, from memory, to remove money from the domestic economy actually cost, I think the economy is something like one or two billion dollars, like just gone overnight. Unemployment just skyrocketed and so on as a result, and essentially there was a real loss of domestic demand within the economy as a result of that. The Employment Contracts Act. Uh, was based on the belief that workers were simply an individual commodity and that unions interfered with the functioning of markets. Roger Douglas had actually made this observation in the late 1980s by observing that pressure groups interfered with markets and what was democracy but a large pressure group. So essentially we're sort of a follow-on from this idea. The market they argued that Richardson argued could only operate effectively and efficiently if the interference of unions and other bodies were removed. The removal of the, of the recognition of unions in the CEAs and uh, was a resulting loss of hard bargaining cost million, workers millions in terms of wages. Union membership plummeted from 6 to 80% to 20%. And shorn of union protection, workers suffered vastly poorer paying conditions. And basically, during the 1990s, unemployment hit 12%, real wages declined by 25%, the income share, that is the share of national income, uh, basically paid to workers compared with the share income paid to the owners of capital, fell markedly, and inequality began to blossom. The political pain of the reforms of Ruth Richardson and the CEA, though, saw national pivot away from undertaking more radical reforms. Basically, what happened was that after both the Mother of All Budgets and the Employment Contracts Act, national fell, I think at one point, to about 21% in falling. Labor didn't really basically benefit all that much. The real beneficiary was this wonderful new political organisation called the Alliance, which certainly which at one point skyrocketed up to about 32% or 33% political support ahead of both national and labour. 
And during the employment contract act, the good old little new Labour Party actually hit the sky rock and heights of 17% popular support. So they became very aware that not only were these new measures being imposed by Richardson politically unfathomable, but they're also economically unfathomable as New Zealand went from a situation where it come out of recession straight back into recession, where it basically existed for most of the 1990s. So after 19, uh, 1993, uh, basically what happened where National nearly lost, the Bolger basically promptly replaced Ruth Richardson with her uh, with Bill Birch. And essentially National, although he's still committed to neoliberalism, was far more of a managed sort of beast and so on. Uh, as a result, they were under no illusions of what would happen if they had gone on with the program. So when the party did attempt, of course, to return to sort of Richardson's uh, vision. In the late 1990s, under Shipley, uh, essentially again, it promptly lost the election. So that was in 1999. So basically, the fourth Labour government and later the um, fourth national government imposed a number of economic and social reforms that removed economic controls and reduced or eliminated economic protection and benefits in a number of areas. Both major parties supported and implemented policies that saw large sections of the Islamic state sector being corporatised and later privatised. Labour and National saw the main role of the government as creating the climate in which the market would operate. They placed faith in the market as a principal driver of the economy. Since 2000, the economic direction of both major parties has settled. Having said that, both parties largely accept the economic reform put in place by the fourth Labour government. There has been a move to blunt some of these reforms, but not remove them. The state has become a more active player, although to a far, far limited extent than it did previously prior to 1984. Uh, there's also been a move towards active state involvement and investment in some areas of infrastructure, such as rail, air, finance, etc. However, these have been as a consequence of market failure and underinvestment in those areas or as a consequence of a recession. And John would know this very well that in fact New Zealand Rail, thanks to the wonderful same rail campaign Richard Treble, and of course the eventual privatisation nearly went bankrupt. With the result that the state had no option but to buy back a rail system that it had created and actually owned anyway. And the same thing happened with New Air New Zealand. We are thanks, of course, to the wonderful policy pursued by Roger Douglas and Ruth Richardson. They sold off our national airline, which promptly nearly sort of being asset stripped and also run nearly bankrupt. With the result, the state had to set it and renationalise it too. This is the brilliance of the marketplace, just pure brilliance. Sorry, just a bit done. So, <coughs> Since, like I said, further, many of these policies currently pursued by both national and labour have also been the result of the electoral system, which has forced them to rely on smaller parties, such as the Alliance, New Zealand First, the Greens, and United Future, and unfortunately ACT. Now, as either formal coalition partners or supporters of either Labour-led or national-led coalitions, the the thing about MMP, and people forget about this, is that MMP is in place for a great reason, and that is that it doesn't actually promote radical response or reforms. MMP is actually about centralisation of economic debate and centralisation of politics. And that was one of the reasons why it was adopted in West Germany after World War II. So, you know, if you're wanting basically radical reform, MMP is not the system that is actually going to deliver that. So as a consequence of this lecturing, I forgive me for my ranting, you should be able to have an understanding of New Zealand's early political development, its constitutional development, 
is a legal development, as part of political development, of finding understanding of, of course, neoliberalism. Um, as you can see, the development of New Zealand as it exists today has not been a straightforward process. There have been a large number of changes that have intervened, the intervening period have dramatically influenced the way and the manner in which New Zealand politics has been conducted. And I fear greatly that it's not over yet. And I can't really see, and this is the thing that even though 62,000 both Labour and National have blunted the reforms, the economic direction largely remains the same. And unfortunately, I can't see it actually radically differing in the near future. And that's it. I'm sorry, my voice is about to come out. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Very good. How ironic can you get that at one stage more doom was to the left of Labour? Oh. Jesus. <laughs>